Although we are sharing this year's events virtually, the festival is based in St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador, and we respectfully acknowledge the land on which we gather as the ancestral homelands of the Beothic, whose culture has been lost forever and can never be recovered. We also acknowledge the island of Uktahumguk, Newfoundland, as the unceded traditional territory of the Beothic and the Mi'kmaq, and we acknowledge Labrador as the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Inuav Ntsinan, the Inuit of Nunatsiavut, and the Inuit of Nunatuhavut. We recognize all First Peoples who are here before us, those who live with us now, and the seven generations to come. As First Peoples have done since time immemorial, we strive to be responsible stewards of the land and to respect the culture, ceremonies, and traditions of all who call it home. As we open our hearts and minds to the past, we commit ourselves to working in a spirit of truth and reconciliation to make a better future for all. Hi everyone and welcome to the very first uh, Seen and Heard panel at this year's St. John's International Women's Film Festival event. I'm really, really thrilled to be hosting this event today. My name is Ruth Lawrence and I am a filmmaker who is based here in St. John's, Newfoundland. And I have with me Hilary Thompson and Michelle LaCour. So these ladies are definitely sound masters. So Hillary works uh, right now, she is the resident Foley artist at NIFCO. And she also works, of course, uh, in other disciplines in the film industry. I've actually worked with Hillary both in the art department and in sound and Foley. So it's really great to have you here today, Hillary. And I can't wait to delve into some more experiences with you. It's a pleasure to be here. And Michelle also is a musician and I guess a fairly recent moved uh moved over a two-hour sound industry in the in the film community here so I, I i'll say recent but you may go back even further so um both these ladies are have been nominated for their work for multiple awards and um we're really lucky to have them both working here in the community with us and uh as i quickly went through your files i couldn't help but notice that both of you have degrees in music recording. So how did that happen? And what took you on the path towards the film industry? Uh, maybe we'll start with Hillary. Sure. Um, well, basically I, I'm classically trained as, as a pianist, you know, when I was young and decided to get into sound for film after after composing a piece on piano when I was in high school. And so then I made my way to Concordia where they had electroacoustic music and sound recording as a major. And um, so I thought that was perfect, it was in Montreal. And, and I was there, I, once I finished that, I noticed that, I mean, it, while studying there, I noticed that electroacoustic music translates really well with film and television. Mm -hmm. And so I figured maybe that's the angle I can, you know, I can go with this. And I ended up working at the National Film Board after I graduated for nine years in the post-production uh, department, um, archiving sound files and synchronizing sound and working in the machine room there. And while I was there, I met a Foley artist and worked with her as an assistant for a little bit and really kind of completely fell in love with that area of post sound. And I got an opportunity to move back here with the National Film Board on a contract with Annette Clark. And I met Lori Clark, who was a Foley artist on the Republic of Doyle at the time. And uh, I came in and, and, and became her assistant until I ended up uh, doing the final two seasons of Doyle. And now I'm the Foley artist on Hudson and Rex. Amazing. Just finished okay. season four. For those of us who are not sound and music experts, tell us a little bit more about electroacoustic <laughs> music electroacoustic music. It's kind of like abstract art painting in a way where there's the rules are kind of, I mean, rules. Um, no melodies, no rhythms, nothing recognizable that you can kind of dance to or anything. It's just kind of like, it's just a bunch of sound that makes you feel something. And at, and when we were in school, we would do electroacoustic. They would do concerts, and you would go to the uh, to to the concert, and you're surrounded by 20 speakers, and they turn out all the lights, so it's all pitch dark. 
and then the electroacoustic artist would play their piece and they would use the mixing board and send all the sounds to all the different speakers and, and basically perform the piece live. Amazing. So I think most filmmakers, most filmmakers who might be listening right now uh, were right with you as soon as you said a sound that makes you feel something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you for that okay over to you michelle tell us a little bit about your journey uh as a musician and then through school and then like into this industry yeah that's funny hillary and i have a number of parallels i was also a <laughs> classical pianist um yeah i kind of wasn't sure what i wanted to do and i went to um memorial university here in St. John's and did um, piano and historical musicology and thought about kind of staying in a more academic route after I realized that uh, being a concert pianist was not in the cards for me. <laughs> um, I got a job at Mun recording the concert series and working in the electronic music lab. And then that kind of spun into more recording jobs at school, helping people record their demos. And I really, really enjoyed it. And I kind of thought that this was going to be a way that I could make music my career uh, without, you know, directly making music my career, being a concert pianist or something like that. Um, my boss at the School of Music told me about this program at McGill uh, in Montreal it was a master of music in sound recording. And I spoke with um, Steve Lilly, who had, who's from here and had already done the program about it and got my application together and yeah, moved to Montreal and started graduate school. Um, I didn't really know a whole lot about the film industry when I started there. We took a few classes. One was actually with Jeff Martin from the NFB, and he took us on a field trip to the National Film Board, and we got to do Foley, and it was so fun. Oh, nice. I was, yeah, it was so much fun. I was like, this is amazing. But I still, after I moved home, didn't really know much about the industry or like how to find work in it. And it wasn't until I was working at a bar mixing because of St. John's Hillary's Brothers Band <laughs> and, <laughs> and our friend Mark, who I didn't know at the time, came to the show and just kind of came up to me and was like, who are you? Like, I know every sound person in town. Like, who are you? Where did you come from? And uh, got to chatting with him and he was like, you need to come down to NIFCO and so that's kind of how it began for me. I started doing post on some of the first time short films and um, did a couple of kind of informal lessons at NIFCO and helped out on a couple of longer films. And then, yeah, started working, I think, first on Hudson and Rex and then started working by myself um, on like documentary films and short, short film shoots and stuff. So... It's been a, it's been a journey. <laughs> well, I'm really glad to hear you say that, like uh, about like being asked to kind of come in because I think that's such a big part of building an industry is like reaching out and bringing people into it. So I'm really get, glad to hear that there's people out there advocating, you know, to get uh, other women and other uh, artists into into our community, which is great. So t so the next 40 minutes or so, we're probably going to do a, a mixed bag of things. We'll talk a little bit of tech maybe. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, some advice or tips that you might give. But first, um, like since, you know, we're here at a masterclass, let's talk first about what are the kinds of things that you uh, hope to see filmmakers bring to you when you start at a project? Um, like what kinds of lists or what kind of preparation do you like to do uh, right off the get go? So maybe Hillary, we'll start with you. Sure. Um when it comes to Foley, um, it's pretty straightforward with what we do. Uh, we take care of everything that any humans or actors touch, uh, interact with that's on screen. Um, so, I mean, like making a list of that kind of stuff is, is a bit of a waste of time. Although now and then um, filmmakers want to create some kind of a mood or something happening. For example, there's a crash off screen that 
makes, you know, causes someone to react who is on screen or different things like that. And so that, that might not be as obvious. It's nice uh, to do a list with time code of spots that you think that, you know, you'd like to hear something special in this spot. Um, it's a good to make that list anyways. And then if it's a sound effects element, then a, the sound effects editor will take care of it. It's if, if it's like a live action crash type thing, then we can do we can do parts of that here as well to bring it to life. So did anything come to mind, like any specific experience that you had come to mind as you were telling me that story, like about something that uh, may have come up that was really special that a filmmaker asked one time, like that you were like, oh, that's a challenge I hadn't thought of or a mood I hadn't anticipated. Like, has anything that sprung to mind? And, and if it doesn't right now, maybe we'll <laughs> it will while we were talking to Michelle. Um, not specifically, I'll, I might have to just think about that for a minute, but I mean, like, like we do do a lot of like, you know, big crashes and stuff like that, which is always lots of fun. Like and well, not really car crashes. It would be more like if uh, a person is thrown over, for example, in one of the episodes in Rex, uh, a bad guy was thrown across a table that was covered in poker chips and plastic glasses and stuff. And then there was a metal cart that was next to it that he hit. And then he hit a chair after that. So everything just went crazy. <laughs> so then that stuff is fun. I really, that kind of stands out because it's just kind of like, you got to really be creative with it. And you look at what's on the, on the table and you say, okay, what do I got here? I've got a cup, I've got poker chips, I got everything. And then you control the fall. You have it like, next to the spot keep it close to the ground or you know as far as we can and then let it drop and just let it do what it needs to do and sometimes it works sometimes sometimes it doesn't if there's specific hits that it doesn't line up with well then we'll go in after and then we'll we'll add that you know if if one coin just kept spinning you know right. then i'll go and because that's kind of hard to make it work when you throw a whole bunch of stuff on the ground so then you control that by doing that on its own. I hadn't considered that you would be choreographing the foley in the same way that the stunt coordinator might be choreographing the fight or the fall. It's interesting. A little bit. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's good to keep in mind. <laughs> okay, yeah. how, how about you, Michelle? Like when you approach going in, say doing location sound, which is what I'm going to assume, but talk about other experiences you've had too. What's this, what are the sort of things that you're looking for from the filmmakers yeah it it's a different approach for uh like fiction and documentary um i tend to when i'm on my own i tend to work more in documentary work but we actually just finished shooting fiction this week um one thing that is really really important for me and this was something that i didn't know to ask for when i was earlier in my career i'm still early career but um, a script or a treatment can be really, really helpful. I went out on a couple of documentary shoots and like didn't really know what we were going to be doing. And if it's not like a straightforward sit down interview, then that can that can be more challenging in the moment than it needs to be. <laughs> um, so anything that like allows me to prepare for documentary work, it's it's helpful to know what the subject matter is. Um, Partly because, uh, you know, I'm often, like, very close to people and, like, putting microphones on them and stuff. So if there's sensitive subject matter and, and things like that, it's important for me to know so that I can be sensitive to that. Um, things like if they're planning on doing a lot of shooting with, like, a drone, for example. Drones are really, really loud and we can't record sound while they're running because all you hear is the drone. So, and the director is saying like, oh my God, it looks amazing because <laughs> it always looks so good. Um, so it's important to know that because then often I'll take it upon myself to go out alone or with the DOP when they're not using the drone so that I can record some audio that's going to match what they're shooting so that if they need something to put in under that, if it's not going to be music, then um, they have something they can work with. And can you give us some examples of like what kinds of things you've gone out to the field to record in the past? 
Yeah, I've been really lucky to travel like all over in Newfoundland and even into Labrador and up the coast a little bit. Um, and of course, shooting here, it's so beautiful. People want to get a lot of like landscapes, um, ocean, there's a lot of shots of the ocean. So I'll go out and record like really close up sounds of the water or just like more broader like ambient sounds kind of more activity and seabirds or like something quieter depending on what it seems like the project calls for um one thing that I found really interesting when I went up to coastal Labrador for a documentary project was uh was like standing up on a hill trying to get away from the diesel plant that like powers the uh town and heard this like really weird bird call and the filmmaker told me that that was a crow and it didn't sound like crows on the island it sounded like something they like coo they don't call it was really really interesting but yeah so I recorded a lot of crow sounds that's, that's really interesting and not something I would have ever thought of and and I think that's the sort of things that we look, can learn from sound people because you're always listening even even when you mentioned the ocean, it got me thinking because like we are so used to feeling the ocean with us, but rarely do we ever consider how loud the ocean is, how present it is until we start to shoot right next to it. And then we yeah. go, why is it so loud? How come I can't hear my, hear my actors? Same thing with rivers and stuff like that. So yeah, I think those are really good things to keep in mind and uh, just to be aware of. It's It's really great. Um, okay, so I want to ask both of you what drew you to the work and then what elements of it do you find the most fun? Because obviously it's work. There's a lot of work. There's a lot of tedium involved. But what are the elements that keep you interested, that keep you kind of coming back all the time? What is, what's the most fun? So, what, so Hillary, Hillary, maybe we'll go back to you again for this one. Sure. Um, I find this kind of job it's it's interesting it's 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 usually just me and my brother who is recording the recording engineer Matthew Thompson in the studio so it's very solitary and um and very quiet i find it very zen mm. and my whole life i've been like i was a gymnast when i was younger and i was big into yoga and stuff so i find it when you just have to like relax all your muscles and then move with the characters there's just this sense of satisfaction when you walk with them and it lines up or if you do a fall and the way you move you land the feet the same way that they did and you know it's just it's it, it's very satisfying <laughs> and then it changes all the time it changes all the time there's always different things that you're trying to create you're trying to come up with different ways of making a sound if you come across something new and then it, like there's water stuff. So we, you know, we fill the pit in the center of the room with water and then, you know, get soaked, <laughs> but, but it sounds right. <laughs> and it's fun. <laughs> and it's not, many, and it's not every day. I wonder how many people have ever seen inside a, a, a Foley studio. And I know that it may be hard, but Maybe you can just uh, show us a little bit, even from a distance, of what you're trying here. I've got all of the pits. We have nine pits on the floor in here, around two and a half feet by two and a half feet wide and deep. And then we fill them with different surfaces. So a lot of exterior surfaces. So we've got, you know, your gravel, your sand. We have a Newfoundland, like, um, rock pit. I'm going to try and lift this to see if this does anything better. So you see, and the one that's covered, that's, that's one of our lids. That one um, is a, it's a sidewalk, it's a piece of sidewalk, so it's a rough concrete surface. So we have like a smooth concrete surface, uh, Newfoundland Beach, all of those things. And then on top of that, I have a removable pit that I put grass and cassette tape and things in, and I use that. Uh, for grass and I can also empty it and put uh, kitty litter in it and I use that for for wet snow sounds <laughs> okay and do you often have to change up those foley uh, pits <laughs> based well, on the project 
not necessarily it's it's really which one am I going to use on this project so it's like you know they all kind of they don't really change it's only that the one that I can pull out you can see it there (laughs) and so that there's two handles that and it lifts out and I lay it on a on the poured concrete floor that we have there, just the smooth one, which is like a, a basement floor or a warehouse floor. And then I lay it on top of that so it's a hard surface underneath it. And then when you walk on it with the crunch, you get the weight and it's not too squishy sounding and you can still get the crunch of the grass or whatever else you put in. You can throw leaves in there, you know. That's the only one that changes, really. Are there any sorts of things that we might use in our daily life that we might not think of that you use like on a regular basis to create a certain sound? Um, you, you, cornstarch, I guess, really? could be one thing. Um, I use that to make the crunches of snow. So I, I, I have one layer of walking on snow that would be walking in the kitty litter. It just it has a wet, like it's obviously clean, <laughs> but, but it's, it's uh it's just got a wet squishy sound to it. And then afterwards I have these pouches that I made from just old leather jackets. I found at a secondhand store and I f- filled them with cornstarch. So. Oh, wow. And I, I do a little pass on top of the feet that I had just done just to add that little extra crunch. And then we have this one who can, where I can do softer snow. Amazing. Wow. <laughs> I would have even thought of that idea. Yeah, this is great. It's a really nice little insight into, even though I've been in Foley sessions, I've never. Really yeah. When someone's been doing it. So this is great. Yeah, we use that one a lot on Hatching, Matching, Dispatching, the Christmas special. (laughs) I bet. (laughs) So much snow. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Uh, So I'm going to give you a little tiny break now and go over to Michelle and ask her, like, what what drew you to the kind of work? What are the things you most enjoy? And, um, yeah, are there any sort of things that you really, really look forward to uh, on a project or or one, one specifically that you've worked on over the years? Yeah, I I really like to to mix it up with my work in general. So, you know, I'm working on a couple of records now and planning a music festival and I'll be working a guitar conference uh, next month. But so I really like mixing it up. So I love doing post and I love doing location sound and the thing about location sound is that like it is never boring there is always like something new getting thrown at you something uh something to keep you on your toes like I feel like it helps me keep my like technical prowess a little bit sharper than it might be if I was just sitting home doing the same thing every day um working on documentaries is very cool because I get to learn so much about topics that I know nothing about or know very, very little about. Um, I was working on a documentary in November with uh, Latonia Hardery and Framed, actually, about the Spirit Song Festival, which I've worked for for years, but, like, I learned so much about the origins of the festival and, like, the significance of it. Um, I was working on a documentary project that brought me up to Labrador and learned a lot about resettlement and relocation, which was fascinating and heartbreaking and just something I had no idea about, which I was a bit ashamed of as a lifelong Newfoundlander. Um, Working in fiction is amazing to, like, when the project is good, and thankfully everything I've worked on has been good. Um... It's just so, like Hillary was saying, it's so satisfying to help bring that to life. Mm-hmm. Um, the project we were just working on over the weekend had a lot of challenges that I had never worked with before because we were shooting under theater lighting. So there's, you know, a dozen lights overhead. So I'm there trying to get my mic in and it's just casting shadows everywhere. So it was challenging in a different way than you know, an interview shoot is challenging, but yeah, it's just so satisfying to, uh, to achieve, like, know that you're getting like a good clean sound and know that like, this is going to be in the final product and 
it's gonna really help sell the story. It's just yeah. really, it's very satisfying. <laughs> I'm always impressed by how location sound people are willing to like go to the go to the wall and like you know get under that table or do. <laughs> It's amazing. I was like sitting at the actor's feet with my microphone yesterday. Never want to have to do that, but I'm always amazed at how willing, uh, you know, the artists are to like make sure that we get get what we're looking for and that they get what they're looking for, and more most importantly, too. Okay, so I want to go back to uh, the bios a little bit because I we did notice that Hillary, you did. You know, you noted in your bio that you did sound archiving at uh, the NFB as part of your job. So tell us a little bit about that and like what the kind of sounds you were working with there and what uses they'd they'd have potentially, or maybe some other aspects of that job that might be of interest to us. Um, well, that job was was taking all of the final mixes, old final mixes on sixteen millimeter and thirty five millimeter film, the mm -hmm. mag. Um, and then I would have to transfer those, uh, basically digitizing them into Pro Tools, and then save those to a disk and send them back to the vaults. And then I'd have to go get the next rack of NFB films. And it was crazy. The vaults they had there, there was like two stories or three. It was insane. There was so many like reels of 35 millimeter film and 16 millimeter film there. So it was about preserving the works that had already yeah. been done. Yeah, because a lot of it was starting to deteriorate and they had an even colder room where they kept the even like the worst stuff that was really so it was, it was basically like I was doing the sound and then there was another guy who was doing the image. So he he had a huge 4K machine and he would transfer the image of all of these final, you know, like these old these old films. And I would do, you know, a, a good quality of the sound transfer that and then they'd get put back together and make their way on the NFB website, I guess. So what did you learn from that experience? Was there anything you took away from that? Um, I, it was, it was nice cause it was very hands-on mm -hmm. and it was very like the old way of working with film. Like you're mm -hmm. splicing stuff and you're splicing it together. And I had this like magnetic viewer that you just lay it right on top and then it just lines up and it, it tells you if like how many tracks are on that tape. Just all these old technology. It was really cool. It was a fun job to do. I did it for a, a while um, within that. But before that, I was, I, was, I was a synchronizing technician. So synchronizing all of the footage from the uh, documentaries that were going on. And so recording from DAT to DVC Pro. And so everything, so with documentary film, there's hours and hours and hours and hours of footage. And I just have to go through every hour. I mean, sometimes the camera would be left on in a bag. It's just like everything. I just get it all. And uh, yeah. And um, so, so that was actually a big learning experience for this, for Foley, in terms of um, really being able to tell if something is off sync. Mm. You know, and I could look at something and very quickly know that, like, no, that's not that's off by a few frames. And it's very helpful here with the Foley yeah. Studio. And I guess too, it also touches on like how technology has changed filmmaking so much. Like there are so many filmmakers who have not had that experience with like mm -hmm. old processes. And, yeah. and it continues to evolve so much, like changes all the time, really. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's basically that point when everything was kind of like switching, you know? It was like, and then it very quickly went to digital and. So now it's all digital over there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. That's interesting too, because I found that like starting out doing a little bit of post, like even yeah. just on a few short, like first time films that are really, really short and like low budget. Um, I found that that was so helpful when I started doing location sound recording because because I know like what the post editor is going to be doing. I know like what I can get away with in the same way and like I know I almost never forget to roll room tone because I know like how important that is because yeah. I've been in the situation where I don't have it <laughs> yeah yeah exactly well I think it too as I listen to both of you one of the things that really comes to me is that like certainly first when I was starting out as a filmmaker I I really didn't know what I didn't know I mean that's you know an obvious thing to say but 
we're also afraid to ask questions sometimes. So like how now do you approach say emerging filmmakers or even like not maybe maybe experienced filmmakers in in terms of like demystifying the process for them and making them uh, feel more comfortable to admit when they don't know it all or if there's something they haven't thought of. How do, how do each of you take that approach? Like Michelle, maybe you want to go first. Yeah, like I, when I was working with the framed program for the Women's Film Festival, I gave a little intro to recording sound for film and I thought it was really cool that they had this workshop um because it wasn't just like aspiring sound people it was also for directors and producers and people who are involved in in the process in other ways and I think it does seem really like mysterious to people like we show up with this big case with this like device and these tiny little microphones and like no one knows what any of it is and it, it can definitely be intimidating um I think most sound mixers, I would say, are big nerds about what we do. So, like, I love it when people express interest. I kind of tend to assume that the director, like, doesn't really care much about what I'm doing. That as long as I'm, like, doing it technically, doing technically a good job, then, like, they know that they're going to have what they need afterwards. But I do, like... I'm I'm always happy to to engage with directors and producers if they want to know more about what I'm doing. Um, one thing that I think people uh, underestimate is how sensitive these little tiny microphones are that we have. So thankfully it hasn't happened in a while, but I've been in situations where like I'm trying to get like a mic placement really precise and and in the best possible location. And I know it's like taking five minutes more than they want, but if you have it in the wrong spot, then like every movement against that microphone is just like destroying your dialogue and stuff that sounds like nothing to our ears when you have like a pair of headphones on and you can hear every movement is just devastating to your final product. Um... So, like, the shoot we were on recently, I I did my, like, you know, my first thing when I try to put a wire on somebody who's just wearing a t-shirt is, like, put it on the chest, and I did that, and it was just atrocious. It was just fabric and hair <laughs> and body and just, like, people sounds, and I was like, this is not going to work. So, I took the extra five minutes to, like, work it through the talent's hair and, like, all the way up to the front of his head and then like you know I can't get the mic pack all the way down on the ankle now so I need to like put it in a sock and safety pin it inside the costume and it's like stuff like that is like uh it probably looks really weird and confusing to people because they're like why don't you just clip it on the shirt like they do on the news but um if you actually have the time to do a good job it makes such a tremendous difference to the final product and also to the bottom line because then you don't have to pay a post editor to fix all your mistakes <laughs> yeah and, and I think that's a really good point is like taking the time uh, that little bit of time at the at the top can actually save you so much time and money later on yeah. yeah and it's hard that was something I found really difficult when I first started out was um asking for that time because you know it's rush 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 like every minute is costing us money we need to start shooting right now but sometimes it's appropriate to be like no we need we need to actually do this right or else it's gonna like ruin your movie <laughs> so besides that that um you know prepping and getting ready what are some of the other things that both of you need or feel that you are lacking sometimes from directors and producers in order to do your best work like what are some of the things that we could be more aware of as directors certainly and producers uh, to help you um on my end one one thing that is very helpful is if you have um like a weird prop in your film mm -hmm. something strange that is just kind of like very odd there's a there was a there was a picture start that we did recently called Spin, and in it there was like a little toy that flicked on and it spun around and made all these lights, but it had this 
noise that it kept making every time you turned it on. And it was kind of very specific. It was just a weird toy. And so it was, it was handy. I asked if she still had it and she did. So she brought it in. So it was ideal that I could actually use the same prop that was used when they shot it. Cause then it's as accurate as it can be. I mean, like I could try to work something out, but that spinning sound was very particular. So when we flicked it on and we just let it go and flicked it off whenever the, you know, the, the kid turned it off and stuff and it, it worked out great. Oh, that's so always. Yeah. So like, like take note of any props um, that are kind of weird sounding or like, you know, Rex, we had a robot dog that would walk on his own and like, I was like, we need that. I don't know how to make that. <laughs> so we got it in and, and it worked great. <laughs> Those are great examples. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Really, you know, you know, just, just don't, you know, to, just don't throw it away when you're finished, <laughs> when you finish shooting. Or give it away. Don't or give it away. Yeah. <laughs> how about you, Michelle? What, uh, what helps you do your best work? Um, when I'm shooting fiction, it's often like, uh, low budget, like local directors. And, uh, and, um, one thing that's really helpful there for me is to have a picture of the costumes. So thankfully I usually know whoever is like in the wardrobe department at this point, And I can just text them and ask them to send me a photo because then I can prep so I can be kind of ready, uh, before I get there. And I don't have to like stand looking at the actor trying to figure out where I'm going to hide a microphone. Um, so like for one movie, a picture start that I helped shoot last year was two men in like long underwear. And so it's like beige and they're both white men. So I was like, okay, I need beige microphones. Like we need to make sure we get them. Cause if they're black, they're going to show right through the costume and be really obvious. Um, uh, if, if there's a tech scout, I find it's really helpful to go on those, um, a lot of times like people are looking for, you know, a house to shoot in and they're like, wow, we found the perfect spot. It's on the merchant road and we're shooting on Wednesday afternoon. I'm like, that is going to be so loud. It's going to be so much traffic. Police cars always going down the street, snow plows, garbage trucks. And so at least then I can, I can let them know so that they can make an informed decision about if they want to keep that location because often with these short low budget films they don't have a big budget for ADR they can't go in after with their actors into Hillary and Matt's studio and re-record their dialogue because they just don't have the budget for it so the sync sound the sound that we get on location is going to be it so for me like I don't you know, get up in directors' faces or anything like that. But I want them to have all the information that they need to make an informed decision. So now that I know, like, what, how to do your best work, tell me what some examples are of some disastrous. Uh, like, what's what what happens when you get to, let's say, you get to a set and something is broken, Michelle? Like something, a part of your equipment. Like, have you ever been in that situation where you suddenly have to improvise? Like what kinds of things have you done? And Hillary, I'm trying to think of like, what would be disastrous for a Foley art artist? So while Michelle answers, maybe I'll give you time to think about it. So Michelle, <laughs> I feel like there must be things that have gone wrong uh, where you've went, okay, what now? Like, do, can you think of any examples? Yeah, for sure. There was one time when I had borrowed some equipment for a shoot and one of the jobs of the audio department is sync. So we are in charge of making sure that there is some way to get the audio from my recorder and the video from the camera to match up in post. Um, so nowadays people tend to use these little tiny boxes called tentacles and they record time code and then send the, or they generate time code and then send it to the camera so that the the time of day on the camera and the sound recorder are precise down to the frame or the millisecond or something very very precise um and i got to the location and i didn't have the right cables the camera person had brought a different camera and it took a different cable and oh no what are we gonna do 
So in that situation, you have to like have backup plans. So whenever we do sync, we usually have three ways of doing it. We'll use our time code boxes, and then we'll also have a microphone on the camera, and then we'll also use a slate, like a clapper, um, that has, like I've got one here somewhere, that has the, uh, the scene on it so that if the boxes fail, and then if for some reason the audio on the camera fails, if it's like really windy and you can't hear any dialogue because the wind is too loud going into the camera audio, well then at least you've got the clapper. So having like backup of a backup of a backup <laughs> is <laughs> the way plan to... <laughs> Always have a plan C. <laughs> yeah, plan C. And then there was, there was a shoot uh, when you and I went to the West Coast and I had my kit put together and I had the right number of microphones. I was like, okay, I'm never going to need more than three microphones. So I brought three labs with me. You know, we're on a budget. We can't like rent a gigantic kit with a bunch of redundancies in it. And then we get to one location and it's like, oh, we actually need four mics. I was like, okay, I know Ruth has a microphone with her, but what am I going to, how am I going to get that microphone into my kit because I didn't have the right cables for it and I think we bought an aux cord from a gas station or I like took one out of somebody's car and managed to like rig it up and like jerry rig it to get it into the recorder so yeah where there's a will there's a way <laughs> it the did work thing, the amazing thing about that is that you were calm as a cucumber because I didn't even realize that it was such a big issue for you at the time so <laughs> Kudos to you for not making that a big, like, it just seemed like you were like, okay, I think I know how to solve this, like, right away. So, yeah, <laughs> just being, having some ingenuity is also goes along with the job. Anything Troubleshooting. That you, yeah, exactly. Anything on your end? Uh, um, disasters or near, near misses? Well, the main one, it wasn't really a disaster, but it was kind of like, it was working on the first first feature film that um, that I got to do Foley for. And it was right after um, the end of the Republic of Doyle. So they decided to renovate this space, the, the Foley studio space and switch it all around. And we had agreed to do this feature film, but then the demolition was starting in here. So we had to figure out a way because we really wanted to do it so we planned it out. Uh, we found there was a warehouse space out in Mount Pearl that we found. And, you know, the guys from NIFCO, we all went over and they basically, they built a massive tent out of sound blankets inside this warehouse. And so I would go inside of it. And then I had like the floor and I just, I brought, just brought buckets of, of dirt and gravel and grassy type things and topsoil and I just made it all happen and we built it all there I had a, a, a TV on a on on wheels in in the tent with me and then Mark Neary was recording at the time and he, his table was outside the tent so he was there watching everything and recording while I was inside the tent doing all the sounds and it worked and we got it done and it was, it was hilarious I can't even believe we did it <laughs> And to create a makeshift Foley studio. Yeah, we built that, like I wasn't an on the go. It to be that big. That's pretty huge. It was. It was. It was kind of ridiculous, but we did it, and it worked. And then this place got finished, and everything worked out great. Yeah, that's amazing. Wow. Okay, so <laughs> even just listening to you talk, I know, like you know, obviously there's reasons why I want to work with you, why I want to work with women. Do you think there's and there's and there's other women, of course, that that are not on the call right now that are working in our industry and across the country. Do you think there's anything um, special about why women are are drawn to it, or or what they anything special that we bring to it as women? I think women have we have a reputation of being really good listeners. I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> No, but I agree. <laughs> I agree. But it's it's really helpful. Like I think Ruth has commented before that like the sound people are often like some of the quietest people in the room because we're always listening. And it is it is such an important aspect of the job, like um listening for extraneous noises that might be able to be removed, but also, you know, when you're on a small set, like 
listening and understanding the story that's being told, um, you know, in fiction that can be like catching a missed line or like a continuity error where someone well, they said a tablespoon every time and they just said ta a teaspoon, like, but in documentary too, like, um, understanding what the story that's being told is and being able to support your director and support your interviewer and support your subject and say, you know, I don't, I don't think we actually got a clean answer to that one. Can we take it again? Yeah, I could not agree more, Michelle, uh, that uh, listening is massive. I mean, and yes, that's what you do as sound people, but you're not always like you're not always necessarily paying attention, nor is it your job to be doing that. But it is so helpful because as directors, certainly I can speak to like, there are so many things that we're watching for and listening for at the same time, that when you have that one person dedicated to it, who, and, and especially when they feel comfortable enough. And this is one of the things I always try to establish on set is the rapport that the sound person should be able to come to me and say, hey, you know, you didn't quite get that. Or you might want to do that again before we break down and move on. Because it it can, you know, like we said earlier, save time and money. But also, like, you may never have access, especially for the documentary, you never have access to that person again. You know, there are so many changing circumstances. So I think that's really key, certainly something that I value. Anything from you that you'd add to that, Hillary? Um on one side of for documentary one thing I've noticed when it comes to sound though sometimes when um interviewees I guess they're holding a pen or they're holding something yeah I remember synchronizing rushes at the film board many times and then it's like just the person they're talking to just happens to have a pen in their hand and they're just like and so um and it's just constant and they don't realize it and no one stop, and no one takes the pen out of their hand because no one realizes that how much noise it's actually making. Little things like that <laughs> are yeah. good notes for specifically documentary because I've noticed that a lot. I find like talking about like working with women, it's it it can be so helpful to be working with women directors too because mm -hmm. they're like as a young woman working in this industry, it can be difficult sometimes to like be heard and to be taken seriously. And there are like, especially older male directors who kind of don't immediately assume that I know what I'm doing or who like, there's kind of this attitude that's going away. I think that's like sound is secondary Mm -hmm. you know and um you know they're so concerned about getting the right picture but then kind of roll their eyes if sound is like hey can we take a second to unplug that refrigerator um I was on a shoot one time where um the director and the director of photography had decided that this really really important conversation was going to happen on top of a hill because it looked stunning but it was like the windiest day of the year and so we're up on top of a hill and I'm shooting this and I was like guys I just I need to let you know like you're not getting it like it's too windy up here like I've got fur on my microphones I've got things buried in people's coats and it sounds like it's just so windy and the guy kind of snatched my headphones and put them on his head and he was like you sound people are always complaining it sounds fine I was like, I know it doesn't, but it's your movie, so go ahead. <laughs> like I've, uh, and it's all about that like informed decision making. Like I'm always just trying to make sure that directors can make an informed decision because ultimately it's it's their movie and it's their choice. But yeah, it's important to to let them know what's going on on your end. Yeah, and for you, why is getting it right so important? I mean, there's a lot of reasons, like. Professionally, I just don't want to be that sound person that gets bad sound. <laughs> like, I don't want, you know, directors to say, ah, oh, yeah, I wouldn't hire her again because, you know, the sound on our movie was, wasn't very good and we had to get someone to go in and fix it in post. Um, so there's that, like, selfish, like, career-focused uh, way of thinking about it for me. But then there's also, like, if I believe in the project, like, I want it to be as good as it possibly can and you know I have some small role in that 
Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's great. That's great to hear that, you know, like, that's, mm -hmm. uh, that's where we all want to be is, is having everybody uh, striving for as perfect as possible. Yeah, we're a team and we're all there exactly. for the same, the same goal in the end is to make a great movie. Exactly. Uh, Hillary, what are some of the challenges, maybe besides time and money, but obviously they're the biggest ones. What are some mm -hmm. of the challenges for you as a Foley artist, like, uh, in getting it right or, or making it the best that you can get it? Like, what do you, what have you come across in the past? Um, well, for me, it's like, I, I want it to be believable, whatever the sound is. And like, for example, um, I was really nervous when we started working on Hudson and Rex because I had to do dog feet and I hadn't really done it before. I played around with using a pair of gloves with um, uh, paper clips on them. So I was trying that around, but you could hear the gloves. The paper clips were too metal sounding. And when I closed my eyes, and like I grew up with a dog, when I closed my eyes and did it, I didn't believe it. So it was just kind of a trial and error that we had to figure out because, I mean, the dog's the main character. He's got to sound right. So we ended up uh, working with the sound editors and stuff and came up with the idea of trying guitar picks so like the their banjo picks ah. and i stick them on my fingers just two on each hand like that and so i use all three fingers to make the sound and then i mean And so I'm like, okay, okay, I can get behind this one. So then we kept going with that. And I mean, I also have like the metal guitar picks for, we were playing around with that idea. We were trying to do ice skating one day and trying to figure out how to make that work. And it's, it's, I mean, that's, that's the trickiest stuff. It's like, sometimes you come across something and you're like, all right, they want us to try to recreate ice skating. I'll try. And so then we used metal guitar picks on a tile floor with a bit of sand sprinkled on it. And it kind of worked. Right. Kind of. I mean, you know, it could probably work the best for an animation. But <laughs> so having that time to really... Yeah, a bit of time to break it down and try to figure out, okay, what is this made out of, you know, what are the elements in this sound I'm trying to recreate? Is it plastic? Is it metal? Is it wood? Is it is it natural is it biological you know like like with the dog if anyone pats the dog i i have some fake some fake fox fur and stuff here that i got from frontier and i wrap it around my leg and just give it a pat you know or like or do it on your ribs because it's got you know that's where you it's more of a hollow sound mm. but just like trial and error with trying to figure out how to make that sound believable and not do the same sound for everything yeah, exactly. And so that does bring up uh, like a whole, you know, realm of, of yeah. uh, things then because it is, it's time, it's money, it's, it's having it's making it. Time. Yeah. And it's like manipulating the props so that it's, it's a realistic sound. And also, so it doesn't sound cut and paste. So it doesn't sound like someone went into a sound library and just placed all these things in. If every cup sounds the same when you lay it down, it sounds weird. Yeah. So then you got to put a human element in it, you know, switch it up if three people are laying cups down don't have them all sound the same yeah so i guess the the kind of prep depends on the project too like how much time you would need yeah always how many people are in a film if there's a lot of characters that's more feet to do mm. um yeah you know like we'll do a whole a whole pass of moves and then a whole pass of feet from beginning to end and then go back again for a third pass of specs and so those first two big passes also gives us time to really spot any any props or specs that we need to kind of focus on and try to get because then, you know, you'll have to go find it and bring it in. So then, you know, OK, we know that later in the week we're going to be hitting this again. So I'll go get it for them. How often are you relying on a, on a Foley bank or do you ever like is are you just a purist and you go, no, I'm never taking a bank of Foley sounds and using them. Well, I mean, I'm not the one behind the computer. Like the sound editor would be the one that would take a Foley bank that you could create. And I mean, you know, they'll, a lot of that kind of stuff is used with video games and stuff. Um, but 
me, everything is, it's, it's all physical. Like, I mean, there's times when I'm, I'm working on something and I know that, that the sound effects editor is also working on the same thing. So like, what can I do that can just add a little extra human to it? Whereas he's going to put like, you know, we had a, we had a, um, a motorcycle crash that skidded out and then like buddy went flying and his helmet was just scraping along the, you know, the, the pavement. So I have a helmet an old skidoo helmet. And so I just knock it and scrape that around. And then, and then Jeff will take care of the metal crash of the bike. And then I threw in a bit of a screeching tire because I have, I learned a trick with a hot water bottle that you can make the sound of a screeching tire just by putting a bit of air in it and closing it off. <laughs> I've learned more about Foley. It's a great party trick. <laughs> Amazing. I would love to see your house and your kit. <laughs> well, my kit is basically at NIFCO. Everything is here. My house, I can't do that. That would be crazy. I would it's like, yeah. There's just, it's, it's just like a junk room back there, but everything has an interesting sound. And, mm. um, you know stuff that I've had to get for other films and then they're in there and then I end up using them again over and over again. It's great. That's just like slowly building the collection of sound making contraptions. <laughs> Everyone listening will be thinking of you now as they go on their daily lives and go, oh, what does that sound sound like? <laughs> Everything what has a sound. What else sounds like that? <laughs> Well, I'm going to, I hate to say this, but we're going to wrap up. So I just want to uh, give you both um, a, a moment to, to talk about anything that we didn't cover. I'm sure there's so mm. much to say, obviously, but I'm going to give you both a moment to just reflect on anything um, I, either that we've missed today or, or any advice or tips or, or whatever you want to say, really. Michelle, let's start with you. I think that sound, both for film and for music, can be a difficult industry for women to break into. Um, it's very much like an old boys club, especially the music industry, I find. Um, and I also, like, I'm hesitant sometimes to tell people that, like, I have a graduate degree because I don't want that to deter anyone and think that, like, that's what you need to get into this industry. So many incredible sound recordists are self-taught or are taught through like less conventional means. So like if there are people who are interested in doing location sound recording or doing post, like starting out on short films, doing workshops, there's so many opportunities out there through the Women's Film Festival and through NIFCO and other things to, um, to like get your foot in the door. I think it is... It is absolutely, like, not beyond anyone if that's what they want to do. And one thing that I really enjoyed when I was, like, in school was um, making, like, movie soundtracks for, like, movies that already exist. So I think that that can be a really fun way for people to, like, try it out. Like, you, Hillary was talking about doing electroacoustics. I did, like, a couple of classes in that um, at Memorial and... We used to do, like, film soundtracks for, like, B-movie, like, sci-fi from the 60s. And that is so fun. So I think, like, um, anyone who's interested in getting into post or even getting into location sound, like, it is doable. And uh, other women in the industry, generally, I find, will try to build you up. So <laughs> reach out. <laughs> yeah, opportunities, I agree. If you go looking for them, they, they will so yeah. How about you, Hillary? Um, one thing I did want to mention was about the studio space that I forgot to mention before was that all of our covers, all of our lids that we have um, here, it's all intern, it's all interior surfaces on the underside of them. So I have like hardwood floor, cork floor, a deck floor on the underside of each of the lids so that we can flip it over and then it's all hidden away if you wanted to. And then when we record, we use two microphones. Um, uh, whenever we do exterior recording, we have a, we try to mimic like what they, what they use on location. So we want to have a shotgun mic. Here we have the Sennheiser MKH416. Um, and then we have a room mic. 
So that's used for interiors. So that will add to the reverb. Matthew will add a reverb to that depending on what kind of room it's in. And then we'll have the close mic taking care of the close sounds and then that will take care of the room sound and make it sound like a warehouse or an elevator or whatever room you're in. And he, and, and he has a bank of reverbs that he'll just add to it just to give that little extra. Amazing. Thank you so much for adding that. I, I, I feel like we don't talk about sound enough for sure. Mm. I'm really glad that the Women's Film Festival is actually put this one together you could each have your own master class easily and i do want to thank you so much for everything that you've imparted today there's been so many um, pieces of wisdom and uh, uh perspectives that that you yeah. brought to me that i didn't didn't really think of before so thank you for that and i know we're going to be off to a great start uh as this one launches the week of workshops and panels so i really really appreciate you coming out today to be with us no, sorry. On the side of women in, in, in film, I wanted to say we've, we're here and we've always kind of been here. We're just kind of in the background making it all work. <laughs> so now it's time to break out. <laughs> Quietly making it work. Yeah, infiltrating. No. <laughs> Thanks so much, Michelle. Thanks, Hillary.